We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. I have spent 35 years helping couples and individuals make better relationships with themselves and others. And I often find myself wondering how much better life would be if we could just be a little less self-critical and kinder to ourselves. So I'm pleased to welcome one of the leading figures in the field of compassion. Paul Gilbert is a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Derby and the founder of their Centre for Compassion Research and Training. Before he retired from the NHS, he was a consultant clinical psychologist. He's the author of The Compassionate Mind, How to Use Compassion to Develop Happiness, Self-Acceptance and Well-Being. He's also the co-author of Mindful Compassion. Paul, what about your upbringing prepared you to become an expert on compassion? Well, I don't know about an expert. You know what they say about experts. X is an unknown quantity and spurt is a drip under pressure. So I'm not <laughs> sure about an expert, but certainly interesting compassion. So I grew up in um, Nigeria, in the outback, really, because my after the war, my father was quite traumatized and sort of disappeared into Africa. So that was quite an interesting experience. We lived in a place that didn't have any electricity, running water, or anything like that. So that was quite good. It sort of connected me to nature in a way. And then I was sent to boarding school, which was not such a good thing. But a whole variety of experiences linked to the observation of suffering. So, for example, when I was in Africa, we had somebody come to the house who had leprosy. Now, those individuals should be in the leper colony. There were special colonies for them. But, you know, I was six, seven, eight. And this person had had his face eaten away, his hands eaten away, was begging for money. And I couldn't find any of my parents were there at the time. And that was a very extraordinary uh, experience to see somebody in so much pain and realize that, you know, diseases and and, um, injuries are really part of life too. And then I suppose the big change for me came in 95. I've been very interested in compassion because I've been interested in Buddhism since my teenage years, and compassion is key in Buddhism, and I very much follow the Mahayanan traditions, and the book you mentioned, Mindful Compassion, was written by a Mahayanan monk. But in 1995, there was a documentary on the Holocaust and the liberation of Belsen and Auschwitz, and um, that was an extraordinary experience, really, and that linked into this awareness of just how incredibly hostile and vicious humans can be to each other. And I mean, it was an incredibly sad experience, really. So I was very moved by that. In fact, I probably cried through nearly the whole movie. You know, They had found these letters in mattresses, mothers who'd written to their children, hoping their children were still alive and that we will meet soon. And the children had either been gassed or they were being used in experiments. So it really brings home the fact that humans are potentially one of the nastiest, most vicious species that have ever existed on this on this earth, if you think about our history of wars and tortures and how we treated women and you know, the Roman games, the process of crucifixion, uh, you can go on and on and on about it, really. So compassion has to address the dark side. We have to understand that humans have an incredibly terrifying dark side and that it's not just about creating happiness and isn't this nice and a bit of kindness. It has to be a real dedication to be aware of what we're capable of and set out to prevent it and instead generate a genuine compassion interest where we can be supportive and helpful to those around us, really. I believe you're interested in in Jung, and he talks very much about the shadow side of us, and we need to accept the shadow emotions. So I think that's really interesting that immediately compassion, we think we're all light and airy, but we have to be conscious of the compassion that there is the darker side too. How important is it to balance those two things? Extremely important. I think the part of the problem is that the, you know a lot of the middle classes in the West have gotten hold of this idea of compassion. Of course, we all have pretty comfortable lives, really, don't we? And now they've turned it into, you know, it's all about love and all that stuff. And that's okay. I'm all in favor of love. But 
In reality, the problems of the world are to do with two things that are not related to compassion, or at least they are, but inversely. One is called callousness. So compassion is having sensitivity to the suffering of others, self and others, and wanting to do something about it. Callousness is you're insensitive. You don't care, right? So you don't set out to cause it, but if you do cause it, you don't really care. So you could think about, for example, fossil fuel industries. They know they're damaging their planet. They don't set out to do that. They don't set out to cause suffering, but they don't really care. And we know that that's true in a lot of, you know, economic processes in the market, for example, people who push market economies don't really care that actually you have a lot of fallout. You know, people lose their jobs as industries go out of business and so on and so on. So that issue of callousness, which is very much in the neoliberal tradition, we don't need to worry about the impacts we're having on other people. We just focus on ourselves and whatever. stuff. So that's quite a serious problem in the West. And then the third one is called cruelty. Now, cruelty That is the point. Causing suffering is the point of what you want to do. And that's to do with vengeance or power and so forth. And in fact, the last 10,000 years, 5,000 years have been an incredible period of immense cruelty to animals and to other humans. And as I say, you can look at the Romans that were an incredibly cruel society. But we have that also still today where you have political prisoners being locked up and tortured and so on and so on. So the callousness and cruelty are really the enemies, if you want to say, of compassion. And therefore, you have we have to address those processes within ourselves, our tendencies to be callous, not to be that bothered about other people, and also at times, our attraction to cruelty. A lot of our entertainments at the moment are basically sadistic, you know, just watching the good guys beat up the bad guys and so on and so on. So you're quite right that we have a very serious shadow that we actually uh, dissociate from. And part of compassion is finding the courage and wisdom to be able to engage with our potential for causing terrible damage and terrible harm. And Ukraine's just another example, really. Because compassion used to belong in the world of spirituality and religion. And in the last sort of 30 years, it's sort of come over into our world of psychology. Why do you think it took psychology so long to start thinking about this specific area? Yeah, it's a great question, Andrew, because I think a lot of psychology was based on trying to understand process, the process of the mind, not necessarily any particular thing. Also, of course, people wanting to understand mental health difficulties, anxieties, depression, and so forth and so on. So, you know, there was a lot of focus on that aspect of psychology, education, you know, how we learn language, all that stuff. And it's only really been in the last 20 years, maybe, that people have began to get very interested in this concept of compassion and its link to caring motives. And one of the big impetuses for that was the Dalai Lama came to the West and he linked up with a number of scientists in the West and said, well, why don't you use your science to study the brain and so forth to find out what happens in people when they become compassionate? And as a result of that, they set up the Mind Life Institute, which has really been a beacon for generating interest in research in compassion. And of course, as we've done the research, we've found that compassion training, when you focus on compassion, it has a huge impact on how your brain works, on how your body works. And so compassion isn't just about being nice. I mean, it is a fundamental organizing principle within your mind and your body, actually. And it it has a revolutionary potential for change. What have we discovered about how compassion works as far as our brain is concerned? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, that humans are a highly social species. Now, we, like other primates, other mammals, we care for our offspring. Now, when you do that, you need to have systems in your brain that can be sensitive to the distress and suffering of another, in this case, the infant. So Mm -hmm. when they send a distress call or whatever, the parent goes and rescues them if they need to be rescued or feeds them or keeps them warm, thermal regulation. So the parent provides what that infant needs to survive because the infant can't do it for themselves. So that is the first principle, really, that compassion has a sensitivity to the other, and we have a range of physiological systems to do that. So one of the hormones that's been very important in attachment behavior is called oxytocin, and oxytocin is very strongly linked to compassion. It's a little bit complicated because oxytocin can also increase aggressiveness to individuals that threaten your baby, for example, but leave that to one side. So when you're doing training, you can stimulate oxytocin receptors. We also know that there's a part of your 
autonomic nervous system called your parasympathetic system. And there's part of that is called the vagus nerve. And your listeners can go and look that up on Google, vagus, V-A-G-U-S, nerve and uh, compassion. And that has a really major impact on a whole range of other processes, such as your immune system, your cardiovascular system, and so forth. And again, when you practice compassion, you are stimulating the vagus. And that helps you to balance the sympathetic nervous system, which is tends to be overstimulated in Western cultures. So, you know, there are quite a lot of physiological changes. And we also know that compassion training changes the frontal cortex. There are parts of the frontal cortex that literally grow when you do compassion training. This is called neuroplasticity. Okay, well, we'll look at compassion training in a second. Just before we get into it, I'd sort of like to understand how long it takes us to sort of do this training. And because my expectation is it's not something you do three times and it's clicked into place. This is a a long-term project. Am I right with that? Yes, absolutely. It's like getting fit, you know. And the other point is if you don't maintain it, we're not, not sure how long it lasts. So a lot of the studies have been quite quick, though, you know, eight to 10 week studies of regular practice. So it's not huge amounts of time. As I say, there's been some fantastic studies done in the Mind Life Institute and those sciences, Richie Davidson's and various Tanya Singer and various other people. So it's not a huge amount of time, but it is a bit of time. You do need to practice on a regular basis. It's developing habits, really, isn't it? Yes, that's a brilliant point. Yes, developing habits. So you build it into your life. So there are two elements, really, what we call the compassionate mind, which is creating all of the physiological systems and ways of thinking and so forth. through But there's also what we call the compassionate self, which is the identity, which is the part of you that you want to become. So, you know, the compassion itself is, I want to be somebody who lives to be helpful, not harmful. That's the basic motto in compassion focus therapy, live to be helpful, not harmful. And that becomes your identity. That's what you focus on. That becomes your intention for living. And then in order to do that, you need to have the brain and the body to do it. So you practice. So which do you think would be better to, to look at first, the compassionate self or the compassionate mind? Um, whichever seems to flow for you, really. I think the compassionate self, because I I think we need to look at some of the resistances to the idea of compassionate, being self-compassionate, because you'd think that it would be an, an easy sell. You know, you just need to be more compassionate to yourself, but you get a lot of resistance. I get quite a few clients that think, well, if I'm going to be self-compassionate, I'm going to be weak. What would you say to that? Yes, I think that's right. I think there's a a serious misunderstanding about compassion, very serious misunderstanding about compassion from a scientific point of view. Where does it come from? What brain systems are it using? People really simply don't understand it. And part of the issue, of course, is to do with religion because we talk about the compassion of Christ, for example. I'm, I'm not religious myself, but that we talk about the compassion of Christ. We don't talk about the kindness of Christ. Oh, what a kind man, you know. So compassion is always about suffering. Okay, that has to be the case. But the problem with it is, is people say, oh, well, you just have to give in and allow yourself to be sacrificed. Then. Is that what it is? You just you don't stand up for yourself. Blah, 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 blah. So it is a weakness. You know, you just got to be kind to people all the time. You You can't do things for yourself. So there's a huge misunderstanding about what compassion is, right? So in our work, we have a lot of work to do in helping people train. What do we mean by compassion? So we say to people, for example, particularly we get guys that say compassion is weak. We say, well, what would motivate a firefighter to risk their lives in a burning house? What do you think would motivate them? Are they going in there for sex? No, I don't think so. Are they going in there to eat? No, I don't think so. Are they going in there to compete and make a lot of money? No, I don't think so. There's only one reason they're going into that house and putting their lives at risk, and that is to save somebody. And that is the fundamental of compassion, to address suffering and the prevention of suffering. That's what it is. Now, if you think that's weak, I would be very surprised about that. So the core of compassion is the courage and the wisdom to engage in suffering wherever it is. And some people will be better at some things than others. Some people are better as compassionate therapists. Some people are better compassionate firefighters. And they're not necessarily equally good at each other's position. But what connects them all, whether you are fighting injustice, whether you are, you know, a doctor on a COVID ward risking your life, whether you are a counselor helping someone, is this desire to address suffering wherever you can. Now, that's the message we have to get across, right? A very serious message. Courage and wisdom are central. You know, compassion without courage is ineffective. 
courage without wisdom can be reckless. Okay, so if I see somebody fall into a fast flowing river and I think I must save them, well, okay, that's courageous, but not if I can't swim and sink like a stone. That is not, that's reckless. So these principles of compassion are absolutely central. When people begin to understand them, they say, oh, okay, now I get it. <laughs> and help me think about this through relationships, because I think you have to be compassionate towards your partner. Because, you know, we're all struggling along on this planet. But there's sometimes it's really quite difficult to be compassionate to our partner because we sort of suddenly think, well, it's letting them excuse bad behavior. Compassion is excusing bad behavior in somebody who's hurt you. So, in our model, then, we ha highlight the fact that compassion can't be weak because if it's weak, then it's not effective, right? It's ineffective. If you don't have the courage, it's ineffective. So if you don't have the courage to engage with what is causing the problem in the relationship, well, and you're just submissive or you give in, then you tend to be resentful, then you ruminate and then blah, blah, blah. And so you get stuck in these loops, which are not actually feeding your relationships, but they're subtly poisoning it and undermining it, right? So helping people understand what feeds your relationship and what poisons it, okay? So resentful submission will poison you, right? So how can you develop the courage then to, and the skill? Because I think what you do, Andrew, is also teaching people skills of conflict resolution. Because love is never a problem. The problem is the conflicts. The conflicts are when you feel disappointed in the other because they didn't do what you want or they don't see it from your point of view or whatever. So the disappointment is there. So that's crucial then that the ability to deal with conflict and understand conflict and tolerate conflict is part of building a loving relationship. Okay. Submitting to the other and then resenting it or being frightened of the other, whatever that is not going to do it. That will poison it. So we have three key things then in compassion focus therapy, which we call assertiveness, forgiveness and apology. So assertiveness is very, very important and learning different types of assertive. So the way you might be assertive to your boss might be different to your child, might be different to your partner. But assertiveness is really holding the principle of being clear about what it is happening for you. I want to come in on uh, assertiveness because that's right at the very core of what I do. And how I see assertiveness is that my needs are important and your needs are important. And it's different from being sort of domineering where my needs are more important than yours or passive where my needs are less important and yours are more important. So I often call assertiveness, I can ask, you can say no, and we can negotiate so that it's nothing about being weak. It's actually about being courageous, about asking for what you want, being able to deal with a no, and then having the negotiation about what you're going to do about it. I think that it's useful to have a broad definition of assertiveness. Now, there were two other things that you wanted to point out. Yeah, and within that, I mean, there are lots of things like the ability to articulate what your position is, right? But also moving away from positions into interests, right? So like in any conflict situation, like, you know, with Ukraine or wherever it is, the parties will state their positions. This is my position, right? This is what I want, blah, 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 blah. But actually, it's really what's in our mutual interest. If we was to work out stuff, what, how would we both gain? So helping people understand what is the mutual interest here, not just is what's your position. And the, the other point is helping people be careful of beliefs, what we call the conditional beliefs. Yeah, but if you love me, you would. Okay, I want to have more sex. Well, if you love me, you would. That belief is a real problem, you know, because there's the conditions, you, people have conditions that, you know, these are tests of your love, really. And a lot of that starts in childhood. So that needs to be made clear in the therapy that those beliefs will be around, they tend to be around. So that's, so all those things about clarity of position, careful of your beliefs, blah, 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 all that stuff, very important. Understanding what's in your common interest, very, very important. It's not in your common interest to be constantly arguing because you're both going to feel like shit. That's not really what you want, is it? All that stuff. And then the next thing is the ability for forgiveness. Mm. Because people will say things and do things which are going to disappoint you. Nobody's perfect. They will, some people really piss you off at times. <laughs> I was saying in my marriage, thought, what on earth did I get married for? What on earth is going on? You know? So the ability to be forgiving is a very compassionate position. And forgiveness, of course, doesn't mean that it's okay what you did. Again, there's a very clear psychology of the process of forgiveness. And then the second thing is the ability to apologize, not submissive, 
but to have a genuine capacity and empathy for the fact that maybe what you said and maybe what you did was hurtful, right? Without shaming yourself and telling yourself you're a bad person. No, you're not a bad person. You're a human being. You're fallible. You can do things. You can cock up. You can be hurtful. The thing to do is just to try as best you can to acknowledge that and then to be able to apologize and explain and so on. So those three things, assertiveness, the ability to forgive, because you're going to have to do that, but also the ability to apologize, because you're not going to go through life and never hurt somebody unintentionally. It will happen. <laughs> so those will all build the compassionate self. Yeah. Any, anything else we should know about building the compassionate self? Well, in terms of relationships, well, what we do in therapy is what we do is we do the classic thing where we invite the partners to face each other, and then they have present listening. So one partner has to listen to the other and the other explains the problems, whatever it is, for two or three minutes. And then this person repeats exactly back. Okay. This person has to agree. The first person has to agree that, yes, okay, that is true. And then they change roles and then they change over. So that if it's a man and a woman, the man becomes a woman, the woman becomes a man. And then they have to present the distress or the annoyances or whatever it is from that position. So we do that. But then They have to do the same thing, but this time of what it is they value in the relationship and what they would like to cultivate in the relationship. And then we invite them to go into the compassionate self and each of them say, as my compassionate self, I would like to bring this into the relationship. I would like to see us grow this way. I'd like to see you grow this way. I'd like to help you grow that way. And so there's a whole series of steps that you can take couples through of perspective taking, empathy development, compassionate wishes, compassionate growth. So those are all kind of key things within relationships. Then in terms of personal development, we are wanting people to do various exercises that support the body, help the body to support the mind. So we show them breathing exercises, posture exercises. So for example, when you're practicing breathing, make sure you're sitting up and you have open chest and the curve in your back should be pointing inwards because when you're at your computer, your back curves outwards. And when that happens, your diaphragm crunches up. So you want to be sitting up straight, curve in the back. That lifts the diaphragm. Then when you do your breathing exercises, which is about, you know, five seconds in, two seconds, notice five seconds out, two seconds in. And you practice this grounding in the breath, grounding in the body. That can be very helpful. And then you do various compassionate psychoeducations, which we can talk about. And then you do various compassionate imageries such as imagining communicating with a compassionate other or imagine you at your compassionate best. And this is quite an easy thing to do, really. You can, you know, people can try this at home. You know, if you've got a little problem in life, nothing too major. Let's do one now, shall we? Talk us through a a little um, exercise that we can all do now. So I'm sitting up straight. I'm arching my back so I'm not crunched over my microphone. I've got my shoulders back and I'm ready to take instructions. Okay, great. So this is called using the body to support the mind, right? Mm-hmm. And there are different breathing patterns which will affect how your autonomic nervous system works. So we're going to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose for five seconds. And the focus of the breath is going to be on the rate of the breath, how many breaths you have per minute, the rhythm of your breath, okay, and the smoothness of the breath and the rate of breath. So I'll count you into this. Okay, so you can look down or close your eyes. So breathing in through your nose and out through your nose. So starting now then, breathing in, two, three, out, two, three, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five. Now just keep that rhythm. Just listen to my voice. Just keep that rhythm. And just noticing that sensation of the air coming down into your lungs and the work should be done by your diaphragm so hardly any movement in the shoulders is all in the diaphragm and you can imagine the air going right down to the base of your spine even and 
And as you're doing this, on the out breath, in a very gentle, supportive voice, you say to yourself, mind slowing down. And that's on the out breath. Everything's on the out breath. The parasympathetic is the out breath. So mind slowing down. Mind slowing down. That's right. Now you can say that out loud or you can just say it to yourself with each out breath up and connect that sensation of body slowing with the breathing, with your posture. Mind slowing down. That's it. And so you can feel that happening. So as you do that, you might notice that you're beginning to feel slightly heavier in the chair, you know, more stable. You can feel the chair holding you up. Okay, so now the next thing to help you is you're going to create a friendly facial expression and bring to mind somebody you really care about, you really like, and that you're sending them this signal. As you meet them, there's this joyfulness at seeing them on your face. So it's just a very slight smile. But create that feeling of friendliness in your face. And notice what happens when you do that. You're stimulating a memory of friendship. You're creating the facial expression of friendship. So notice what happens when you do that. And now when you're ready, just go back to a neutral facial expression or a worried facial expression, if you like. Notice how your emotion in your body changes very subtly when you shift back to your friendly expression, remembering your friend and uh, the greeting Oh, hello. A friendly connectedness. Okay, great. So these, these are useful things. So here's another thing that you can see and recognize the power of imagery. Okay. So I'd like you to remember a time when you were happy and laughing. Maybe somebody told you a good joke or you were at a party or something. Try and remember the last time you were laughing. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking of this precise moment of my great niece on my shoulders as we walked along and she was holding on to my hat. I was holding on to her hands to stop her from falling over and uh, we were both laughing. I see. So what are you feeling in your body? Well, I'm feeling a heavy child on my on my shoulders, but uh, <laughs> but also a great sense of fun and um, youthful curiosity about the world, and you know the excitement of travelling high up, yeah, and the connection. The brilliant point that you're making there, Andrew, is that that memory comes with body experience, right? That's the thing. You've got body experience coming in. It's not just pictures in your mind. Lots of other things are flowing through your body. Now, if I was to ask you now to remember the last time you were angry with somebody, okay, you can do that very briefly, you will notice a really massive change in what's happening in your body when you do that. Yeah, I mean, it's tightening up, isn't it? Yes, yeah, tightening up. So this is a very clear demonstration that what we remember, what we focus on, what we imagine has very major impacts on felt experience, okay? Now, if you're depressed or you've got a problem, you get trapped in thinking and imagining depressive things. And of course, when you do that, then your body is going to constantly be put into these depressive states. But if you can learn to switch in what you create in your memory, what you create in imagery, you start practicing different images, different scenarios in your mind. Although it's difficult, over time, you will be stimulating different physiological systems in your brain and your body, just like we've done just this moment, right? So that's a little example of how you use your body to support your mind, doing the breathing and the grounding. But you can also begin to use different forms of imagery to stimulate different systems in your brain. We've been working on the compassion itself here, or is this 
the compassionate mind. I'm getting a little bit confused between the two. Help me out. Okay, so that's great. So you asked me to offer you some exercises. So the exercises are to stimulate the compassionate mind, all right? But compassionate identity is the process of understanding that we all suffer, and that life is really full of suffering, and that what person do you want to be? What are your values? What are you going to live to, right? The compassionate self, in the Buddhist position, it's called bodhicitta, the desire to live to address suffering in self and others. So that's a, a crucial element, really, that identity. Say that again, because that feels really important. So in the Buddhist traditions, it's called bodhicitta, which is the recognition that suffering is all around us. And I can go into that if you like. But I would dedicate myself to try wherever I can to address it in myself and other people. And that is, I will live as best I can to be helpful, not harmful. The recognition is very easy for me to be harmful, actually. So I would try. That is my intention. And when you have that intention, then processes such as being mindful and being aware of what's going on in your mind will help you live to your intention, okay? It's like driving a car. You know, you want to drive from one city to another, but you have to have your intention with attention because otherwise you're going to wander all over the motorway and smash into other cars. So intention and attention are very closely linked. Um, so the more we have the, the intention, the desire to live like that, that's the identity, then the more we will pay attention to where our mind is and what it's doing and keep it in a compassionate mind state as best we can. We can't always, but as best we can. One of the problems is we aim to be compassionate and we fail because we're human beings. One of my favourite sayings is from the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight was ever made. Yes. You know, we are human beings. We're going to fail at compassion from time to time. Yes. But somehow we need to be compassionate about ourselves, about the fact that we can't be compassionate all the time. Yeah, it brings you back to forgiveness and apology, really. With compassion is for the dark side. That's what I'm interested in. I've always been interested in that, really. Yeah, happiness and all that, that's great, but that's not what we, you know, in the book, the Compassionate Mind book, it's about the challenges of life, okay? How you use compassion for the challenges of life. Now, the fact of the matter is that you have a brain that you didn't design, okay? No living thing on this planet chose to be here. No animal chose to be what it is. No snake chose to be a snake, crocodile, crocodile, whatever. A lion didn't choose to be a predator. No human chose to be human. You didn't choose to be a male. I didn't choose to be. And so, so we understand this, that we are biologically created beings to survive and reproduce. And I, we have been built by DNA. And in that process, we have brains which are capable of the most wonderful things and the most terrifying things. But that's not our fault. We didn't design it like that. Our issue is trying to understand how it's working. And the fact of the matter is that these systems, these anxiety and anger, all these systems are designed to control your behavior. That's what they're designed to do. Nature designed it that way so that you would lose control of your behavior. Okay. Most animals can't sit down and think, you know what? I'm a bit anxious today, but you know, I think I might do this or do that. <laughs> they can't. So most up until reasonably recently into the human mind, all of these systems are designed to take control of your mind, and they will. So the point is that sometimes you will find yourself behaving badly or immorally or making mistakes or trying things and failing. So how are you going to deal with that, given that you didn't design your brain to be that way, did you? How are you going to deal with that? Nearly all of our mental suffering comes when we don't want it. Nobody wakes up in the morning that says, you know what, my <laughs> My life is very boring. I think I'm going to have some panic attacks. In fact, I'm going to go and train myself to scare myself shitless. Actually, um, I'm too happy. I think I need to practice having suicidal depression. No, no, it doesn't work like that, okay? These states of mind come against your will, right? That's the thing. You didn't choose them. You haven't been training for them. Your conscious will, I think we your have to say. Will. Yes, it's a very excellent point there, your conscious will. But you can use your conscious will to think about, so what you want to do. So the key thing then is recognizing the basis of why we struggle. That has to be the beginning, because if you become over-identified with it, that it's about you and all that stuff, that gets too personal. Whereas what you want to be able to do is to stand back and think, okay, so what is my mind doing? Okay, now I'm not, I didn't choose to have a mind that does that, 
but it is my mind. So I need to try as best I can to work with it as best I can. So that's very, very crucial. And in therapy, we used to say to people, I'm going to teach you how to fail. They'd say, well, what do you mean? Well, success looks after itself. But if you can fail and get back on your horse, as it were, without beating yourself up, then you're going to succeed. But if you kick yourself when things are going badly, that is going to be really difficult. And I think one of our great problems is that we divide things into good and bad. So, you know, compassion, good, anger, bad. And all of these feelings like anger possibly have a lesson. There might be a reason why we're angry. There might be something we need to pay attention to. So this idea that anger is bad and love is good. I mean, there's some terrible things done in the name of love. Love isn't necessarily always good. This sort of sense of, uh, we're back to where we started, everything has a shadow side to it. And actually saying that anger is bad, and therefore being angry, I'm a bad person, is a cause of a lot of suffering. That's quite right. Now, the thing is, all emotions and all motives have function and form, function and form. Okay, so what is the function of anger? What's it designed to do? It's designed to help you address obstacles, blocks, or threats to you, right? That's what it's designed to do, and therefore it's quite useful. What form does it take? Well, it could take the form of assertiveness, or I could get a gun and shoot you. Mm. So the point is the form that something like anger takes is very different to its function. So the functions of anger are really very important. I mean, people often ask me, well, you know, what drives your compassion? Anger. Anger. I mean, you know, I think we have been conned in so many ways in religion and all other things. You know, this is a, you know, beautiful world and all the rest of it. No, it's not. Okay. This world has seen 99% of all living forms have gone extinct. There have been about four or five mass extinctions where just almost within a year, life has just gone out of existence. 70, 80% of life's gone out of existence. We're marinated in bacteria, in viruses whole process of many forms of life is predatory, okay? You think what's going on in the sea right now, I mean, trillions and trillions of species are being preyed upon. <laughs> you look at what happens to turtles. You know, 95% of turtles won't make it to adulthood because they'll be in some other species' stomach. You know, we've got to be sensible about this. You know, we get carried away with all this, oh, is nature wonderful? Well, it can be, but it can be deadly, COVID is just the most recent example of another bit of DNA that really kills organisms like me. And that has caused terrible suffering to millions and millions of people. But it's only one of many of these uh, viruses. So for me, finding myself in a world like this, not only a world where humans exist who do terrible things, you know, maybe a couple of hundred years ago, if I was in Africa, I could have been picked up as a slave or I could have been taken and tortured. No, no, that, that can't be, <laughs> that cannot be right. Don't give me all this stuff about loving gods and everything. It's not like that. Okay. And compassion is the courage and the wisdom to see the causes of suffering, which is in the whole nature of biological life. The whole nature of biological life is it comes into existence. It exists for a short time. It does its thing, creates, decays, and dies. And some of that process of decaying and dying is extremely unpleasant. You know, dying of cancers or dementias, it's extremely unpleasant. So compassion, then, is what drives us to say, let's understand the causes of human suffering and let's address them in as much courage and wisdom as we can. So for me, anger is a very powerful force. This should not be. That is the issue of anger. But... <laughs> if you go around hurting people, then you are contributing to the suffering, aren't you, really? And it is difficult because we want to be compassionate to ourselves, but we don't want to let ourselves off the hook for bad behaviour. No, and that's an important question, Ratch, actually, Andrew, because we have to make a very clear distinction between shame and guilt because people confuse these all the time, right? Supposing you have two people who have had an affair and their partners discover them. When you have shame... What happens is the individual feels bad about themselves. I shouldn't have done that. Other people will feel bad about me. My partner will feel bad about me. They're not going to love me anymore. And so the issue is me, me, me. Oh, and don't forget about me. I'm bad. You think I'm bad. Blah, 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 blah. It's a basically a narcissistic injury shame. And it's very powerful. Guilt, on the other hand, is very little to do 
with the self. Guilt is the recognition that I've hurt you. And the emotions associated with guilt are sorrow and remorse, a deep sense of remorse. I, it's not about whether I'm a bad person or not. It's about how can I now help you? How can I help you repair? You know, how can, what can I do to put this right? So if I <laughs> suppose that say, okay, I'll buy you some flowers <laughs> as an apology or whatever. So if it's from a shame point of view, I'm doing it because I want you to like me again. Mm -hmm. right? If it's from a guilt point of view, I'm doing it because I'm showing you I appreciate I've hurt you. And uh, I'm wanting to try to make amends for you. It's not about me. It's for you. And if you don't love me, then I shall have to face that. But that genuine desire to repair and make right, as opposed to repair yourself. <laughs> The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So one of the things that we've started to do is create a Substack newsletter, and I'd love my Meaningful Life listeners to subscribe. The newsletter comes about every two weeks. It's a mixture of relationship advice and my thoughts about building a meaningful life. I hope that it grows to become a sort of shared space where you can tell me your thoughts and suggest ideas for new podcast episodes. You can find everything at themeaningfullife.substack.com. So please do sign up. Details will also be in the show notes. We'll also have details of the vagus nerve and all the details about the compassionate mind and living the compassionate self. Now, one of the things that we'd also like you to do is participate in the program by sending us a dilemma, something that is an issue for you, because I scour the world to find all sorts of people with interests, I'm not using the word expert, interests that might be helpful. And I think I've hopefully got a good connection of letter and um, person with interests. And so here is the letter, and it's uh, written by a woman. When I make a mistake, suddenly I hate myself. This doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it's like I'm not allowed to be human like everybody else. I can be quite forgiving of the other people, like friends, but I have to hold myself to way higher standards. At work, I'm always the best prepared in a meeting, and I feel I have to justify my recent promotion by being on top of my brief and having a good understanding of the departments that intersect with mine. And if something goes wrong in my department, even if it's someone under me or even my boss, I feel dirty and disgusting, even though I wasn't the one who acted wrongly. Can you relate or am I the only one who feels like this? Paul. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> it's a lot of people. Welcome uh, to the human race. Yes, there's all kinds of things. You know, people call it the fake syndrome. I'm a fake and all that stuff. So what is the psychology of that? Then? Let's have a look at the psychology. Just begin to pull it apart. Now, the first thing really is to realize that we have lived within hierarchies. And in hierarchies, particularly within animals, if the dominant attacks a subordinate, the subordinate must submit. They must go down. They if they fight back, then they get severely injury, injured. So submissive behavior is very much part of how hierarchies work. It's not just all about aggression. It's also about submissiveness. And families are hierarchies as well, aren't they? And families are very hierarchical. Well, some are more than others, and some are hierarchical with an aggression behind it as opposed to love behind it. Now, we don't know what kind of environment you grew up in, but that issue about doing something then that will call disapproval of other people that will get you criticized, that's often a common history. So this idea is I can't make a mistake. Why? What is going to happen? Okay. How are other people going to treat you? That is where the problem is. The understanding about what other people will see in me, how they will see me. Will they care for me or will they devalue me or will they shame me? Or will I end up just, you know, marginalized or whatever it is? And what happens for children that grow up in these environments is they become hyper competitive. They've got to achieve. They've got to do well. They've got to, got to, got to, got to. Otherwise, they're out the group. Nobody will want them. 
If you're not this, if you're not that, if you're not this, if you're not that, if you're not beautiful, if you're not thin, if you don't do this, then who will want you? So when you're working with this issue, it's not really about your judgment of self. It's about your fears, your social fear about how the world will treat you if you don't come up to standard. And also people that have this kind of issue is they also hope that if they can become super competent and wonderful, that's the end of the game. They'll never be rejected again. People will love them forever. <laughs> so, you know, the, the point about it is it's a recognition that underneath a lot of the drive is the desperate desire to be loved for what you are, to be allowed to be human. As you say, can I be allowed to be human? Well, who is doing the allowing? Okay. Who is doing the allowing? Okay. And understanding that maybe there is really quite a deep issues to do with fears of loneliness or being rejected or whatever. And therefore, your compassion goes to that part of you, that part of you that's been struggling, that part of you that's been struggling. And then the second element of this, which would be more of a therapy element, is beginning to recognize that there can also be side by side quite a lot of rage for those individuals who made you feel like that, for those individuals who made you, gave you that drive, you know. And so in therapy, we also look at the anger that sits, can sit underneath it. So there's a grief that can sit underneath it, but there can also be anger. Why was I put under that much pressure? Well, you. <laughs> so when you say you have to be compassionate for that part of yourself, help us get an image that would be useful for that. Well, again, this is, you know, taking people into steps of therapy, but the key thing is recognizing that in the heart of all of us, is a desire for belonging and connectedness, right? And the shame is the thing that separates us out, you know, it makes us feel separate, unwanted, you know, unclean, as this lady was talking about. That sense of disgust, right? What is that about? It's like, you know, I've become contaminated, which means that I'm not wanted. So disgust is about expelling, not wanting, I don't want you, go away. So that emotion of disgust is the inner experience of not being wanted, being pushed away, right? So that's what you're feeling when you, fail and you get that feeling so the key thing then is to recognize that we are compassionate to that sense of uh, fear that sense of loneliness that sense of being pushed away not being wanted that we might imagine it as that what happened when you were a child that you first began to experience that stuff and then we bring our compassion and our wisdom to that to the fear. So we're not going to really address your criticism because that just gets harsh and it says horrible things to you. Don't we? But what we do address is what sits underneath that, which is the loneliness or the anger of what's happened to you or whatever. That's where your compassion goes to. And the words dirty and disgusting really leap out. And that, as a therapist, is really useful because it suggests a way into this. So I think, you know, what age are you when you imagine those two words? And I think we send the compassion to that little girl. Yeah, and because that, I think that act of imagination makes it much easier to be compassionate. You know, you might not be able to be compassionate to yourself today, but I'm sure you can be compassionate to yourself. And I'm just grabbing a figure aged eight. Because, you know, you don't understand the world at eight. You're very vulnerable. And I think you can be compassionate towards yourself as a small child. That's right. Absolutely. And the key, I mean, you know, obviously we, we don't know what's happened in your background. There could have been some really horrible things. We just don't know. But so the compassion always goes to that sense of where the wounds are, where the hurt is, where the injury is. Because, you know, you didn't wake up one day and think, you know what? I think I'll be a critic. I think I'd be just, yeah, I could, I could like myself, but I decided not to do it. It doesn't happen that way, right? This has happened to you. You didn't choose to be this way. It's just emerged within you. And part of it is helping you understand how did this system emerge within me? What's it doing? What's its function? What do I want to do about it? And I would always say in the therapy that we do is this is a difficult one if you're on your own of recognizing that there may be quite a lot of rage. All right. Cause we often say, you know, go do the grief work to the, the little girl and so on and so on, which is important. But there can also be a lot of fuck you rage, frankly. You know, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that to me. You shouldn't have treated me that way. That is not right. And I wouldn't do it to other people and blah, blah, blah. And the ability to tolerate that anger to the other 
can be really quite important. And this was a Freud. Freud said this in 1917. Freud said that we often blame ourselves because actually we harbor a lot of anger to those who have hurt us, but we're frightened of it. Yeah. Okay. We're frightened of releasing it because then that would really make us bad, wouldn't it? So, well, and, you know, they might leave us if we might leave us. Yeah. yeah. So we're dealing with very primal things. So, and it's okay to ask for help. Very much so. Uh, very much so. And it's these kinds of situations, if you're very stuck in it, you know, going to therapy can be extremely helpful to work through. But the key thing, firstly, is to recognize that this is not your fault. You didn't choose this, right? But it's causing you a problem so that you can stand back from that. Think, okay, so how did this start? What was its function? How did it get going? And how can I now treat or work with those early parts that were hurt or upset or whatever, both in terms of understanding the grief, the sadness of feeling lonely and not wanted, but also the anger at, hang on a minute, you shouldn't do that. I mean, I mean, I think that's beautiful to divide the response up into two parts, the grief and the rage, uh, because yeah. they can get mixed up with each other. They can. And I, I love that idea that you can do some of the grieving yourself, but you might need a bit of help with the rage. So thank you for being a guest on The Meaningful Life. I have to ask you now, what makes your life meaningful? Well, I'm incredibly lucky. I mean, obviously, family is extremely important. Of course, that's true for all. But I'm very lucky in the sense that I have an opportunity to study something that I really, really love and I passionately believe in. And we have a whole series of innovations. You know, we're doing compassion in politics with a compassion business group. We're doing compassion mm-hmm. schools. So I'm absolutely enthralled by what life has given me an opportunity to do. So I'm lucky in that, in that sense that I find my work very meaningful. I find my friends very meaningful, my family. So, I, you know, in many ways, I'm incredibly fortunate, but I can still be angry with life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, unfortunately, this is where the conversation ends, unless you are a supporter of The Meaningful Life. Well, in the minute, we'll give you details of how to become that. You'll be able to hear the bonus material, or you can subscribe directly. If you're an Apple listener, you'll find there is a button to press, and the same with Spotify. And um, the conversation is going to continue. We're going to look at the link between compassion and depression, and how compassion uh, training and the compassionate mind can help with the subject of depression, because we've talked much more about anger than depression, and we'll be doing that in just a moment. But if you'd like to find out how to become a supporter, here comes the information. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Collick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.